All right. Well, welcome. I've, this is the last session, right? So the only thing I can figure out, I've done test sessions a lot over the years. The only thing I can figure out is that somebody promised beer or something at this session to get all you people here. Um, it's cr great to see you, first of all. I mean, I, seriously, I've done test sessions where it's been pretty small. So this is great to see this uh, amount of interest in this topic, and uh, hopefully we'll get you some information that can help you. Um, but we also want to have uh, some time to to get some feedback to, uh, from, from all of you and some of the things that you need from us because I, I think we're, we're clear that there's probably some gaps and, and, and some unknowns in the ecosystem with testing. So I'm Dave Frosley, um, and Yoris is here as well. Um, we're talking about testing principles as well as some features and strategies for, for testing in the ecosystem. Um, pretty straightforward agenda. Um, so a little bit of background, I've been involved in, in test at Microsoft for a number of years, uh, specifically with Dynamics. Um, I've been in a variety of roles with the company, but probably more than any other role in the 15 years I've been here, I've had a title of test architect and have led some tools teams as well. So I've been around this topic quite a bit. It kind of drew Yoris and I together a few years back uh, when he was in the partner ecosystem and, and working on dev tools, uh, we kind of connected up and, and looked at some things a few years ago. So um, that's a little bit about ourselves. Um, what I'm going to focus on for the first part here is really the principles that we used internally for the AX7 release cycle. Um, we, we changed how we approach automated testing quite a bit with that release, and we actually had some really nice success with the changes in process and testability tools that are in the product right now. So I'm going to walk through some things. Uh, all this stuff is in blog posts that, that I've written about, so um, it's, it's all out there. These slides are three, four years old in general, so they're, they've been pretty stable over time. These are the things that we've been following internally um, with our practices uh, through, throughout the release. And I guess the other, one other thing I'll mention is that um, before the X7 timeframe, I was primarily working on, on more of the platform and tooling side of the, the, uh, the Dynamics development efforts. The last few years, I've been on the app side, which has really, I think, been beneficial to help really drive the, these, these principles into the organization. So the first thing I want to talk about is a balanced approach to validation. And this isn't actually specifically talking about automation. It's really about validation in general. And this matrix has been around for many years. Uh, Brian Merrick is uh, kind of a, a leader in the agile software world, especially on the test side. He, he was the one who first came up with this matrix. And you can see there's, there's a simple two-dimensional uh, quadrant that set of quadrants that have two uh, areas to think about. So on the horizontal, you, you're, you're doing two things, one of two things and several things in between related to your validation. You're either supporting your engineering efforts, which is helping move the, the, move the product forward um, with confidence, but then there's another part of it that's about critiquing the product and making sure the customer is, is getting what the customer expected. So you can think about a little bit like requirements and the design process and development process. And then there's kind of a terminology thing. You either have technology-facing terminology in your test or you have customer-facing terminology in your test. And the thing that's important about this quadrant view is to point out that there's not one size, one thing that solves every testing need that you want to accomplish. And that's something that we struggle with a lot of times. It's like, well, if I just had some end-to-end -end tests that you know, verify customer requirements, we could use it all through the engineering process, we could, we could do everything with that. We could test performance with it because uh, there's a performance session before this, I understand. It just doesn't work that well. You need to have this balanced approach. You need humans in the loop at times. You need automation at other times. So I'll give you some examples. So first of all, what we normally think about validation is in the upper right. It's customer facing and it's critiquing the product. And I have some examples in there. It's, it's really focused on meeting the requirements, meeting the business requirements, meeting the user requirements for the product. And 
you know, exploratory test sessions is something I'll throw out there, is, is something that's important. That's not a regression technique, that's a technique to discover bugs. You're going to find a lot more bugs through exploratory testing than you are going to via regression testing. A lot of times the best way to do this is with a human. Humans see a lot more than a machine's ever going to see from an automation perspective. So having people go and touch the product and, and uh, use the product and make sure the answers are right throughout is, is really valuable. We go to the other extreme where we're supporting engineering and technology facing, then you're really talking about unit component tests. And this is where automation needs to happen. This is a, the top priority for, from an automation perspective, and we'll, we'll hammer on that a little bit more as we go. It's technology facing in that the terminology of the test is classes and methods and, and things like that. Um, and it's really meant to support engineering so that as you're developing, you can run these, these granular tests over and over again to make sure that you're not um, introducing failures in the system. The optimal scenario is when you're doing test driven development. You write your unit test before your, your implementation and you're working from that level of confidence. You're always green from a, a, a red-green refactor uh, perspective. Um, you can always end the day at a green state and you know where you are when you start the next day. So those are kind of the two obvious extremes. But we have the other two quadrants to talk about a little bit as well. So customer facing and supporting engineering you think about integration tests or some of these end-to-end -end scenarios where it makes sense to do some level of automation for these tests. It's, you don't want to have a human doing every single step of a regression suite that involves business process um, when it comes time to release. So providing a way to do some automation uh, for these types of tests makes sense. It's, it's something you need to do. And then if you go to the other quadrant where it's more technology facing, then you get into some of the things that they talked about in the last session where you're, you're really critiquing the product from a performance perspective, for example, but the terminology is frequently technology. It's transactions and, and SQL and, and things like that. So that's, that's the other quadrant. But the bottom line is you need to think about all these things and realize that you have to have different types of tests for different types of situations and depending on what your emphasis really is. The next slide talks about when you do automation, what are you striving to accomplish, accomplish from a test quality perspective? This is literally a slide from a, some training we did, I think probably three years ago, um, early on the AX7 timeframe internally, where we went and talked to all the engin app engineers on the team about these qualities. So we need it to be reliable, maintainable, fast, simple, and precise. And some of these are pretty obvious, right? Um, obvious but hard. Uh, we need it to be reliable. You want to get the same answer all the time. You don't want to have a bunch of infrastructure issues or um, interface issues or other things like that that cause tests to fail. You want tests to fail for product reasons, not for other reasons. You need them to be maintainable because if they fail and you aren't able to update them, um, or even if they don't fail, you're changing the product and you need to test update with it. You need, need that maintainability to be there. Um, tests are fast. You want tests. The last thing you want to do is that the tests are so slow that the engineers can't run them locally while they're doing development. A huge uh, KPI that I think about with tests is how often they're run. I want them to be run over and over again, and we run tests millions of times a day at this point. And if you're only running them once a week, you're bound to fail. They need to be simple, and this is something we really we spent a lot of time talking to people about. You don't want a bunch of complexity. You want the tests to basically read themselves to you. You, should be able to, you shouldn't need comments. It should be that simple in order to look at the test and understand what it's up to. And then the other thing is precise, which is something we haven't always thought about a lot. But the idea there is that when a test fails, you know why, why it failed, and you could easily go and solve the problem. So this is a challenge with longer tests, right? It, it fails. Well, now where do I start? If a unit test fails, it's a pretty good idea what's going on. 
So that's our automated test qualities. And then the last thing to talk about um, from a, a principal standpoint is the uh, automated test pyramid. Again, this isn't anything new. Um, hopefully a lot of you have seen some variation of this um, in the past. But basically the foundation is unit tests, which is really a design focused activity. Then you have component tests, integration tests, and business cycle tests. There's, there's variations of this with three levels and different terminology, but this is what we've used internally over the last, uh, last few years. And we actually have this, our tests attributed like this so we know what the, the makeup of the different tests are. And I, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the definition, but in general, you know, a, a rule of thumb is if you have an order of magnitude difference between these different levels, you're probably in the right place. So if you have a thousand unit tests, you might have a hundred component tests, you might have 10 integration tests, and you might have a single business cycle test. So in the X2012 timeframe, our pyramid looked more like an hourglass. We had a lot of unit tests, and we had a lot of integration tests, and we had a lot of problems. We consistently had pass rates in maybe the 80% kind of time frame. These tests took hundreds of hours to run. We, we, we distributed them, we scaled out, but still it took 24 hours across 100 machines or more in a lot of cases. And it was a constant problem with the test team to try to keep current with, with these tests. Interestingly enough, uh, many of you are probably know that we, we changed the disciplines of Microsoft a few years back, probably about the same time that we started AX7, where we merged the, the, the test and development um, functions into an engineering function. And I, in my opinion is that we've, we've gained a lot from that, especially from an engineering standpoint, because we have that shared responsibility now, and it's not a, a, a throw it over the wall kind of thing. We certainly tried not to throw it over the wall in the past, but um, Reality was it works better when you have that responsibility built in. So that was a big change from an hourglass to the pyramid. So what does it look like in the end? Um, so if you look at the pyramid in the upper right, that's, that's our test. And we actually, we didn't really make a focused effort to get the 10 to 1, the order of magnitude difference, but reality was that's where we've landed, is, is it's pretty close to a a order of magnitude difference between these different levels of tests. Um, we focused on the test qualities, we focused on the pyramid, and we also introduced a number of new testability features that we're gonna talk about next, which really were game changers in a lot of ways for us. So those three key things more than anything else. Our pass rates went from 80% to typically over 99.5%. So very few tests were failing. When tests failed, then you had a pretty good idea that it was something real that was happening, and you, it was much easier to go investigate and understand what's going on. There wasn't, before it, we'd get close to a release and we'd have to go figure out why all these tests were failing, and it was always a big effort to figure that out before we released. Now, we just have confidence that things are running pretty well. Part of that benefit, that, or part of the gain there was because we moved tests further up into our, our development process because they were faster, more reliable. Now we could put them into our check-in process and we have over half of our tests in our check-in process. So with every check-in that goes in, we run 50,000 some tests. And if something breaks a test, that check-in doesn't go in. So now we've prevented both defects and test breaks from getting into our, into our source code control system and screwing up builds and, and then getting this lag before we actually find out what's happening with the test failure. Um, fast, there's, I mean, it's at least 100x improvement in our performance of our tests overall. And that largely due to the testability changes, but also because of how we approach the, the tests from a pyramid's perspective. From a simplicity standpoint, we, I've said this a lot over the last few years, understand what you're testing and test precisely that. So it's okay to have an integration test, but don't test everything in the world along the way while you're doing an integration test. Focus on what you're doing with the integration test. You're trying to get to an end result, verify that end result. If there's things that you need to test that are subparts of the process, do those in separate tests and target those in those tests. And then the, the precision, 
uh, got a lot better because of a lot of these things. I mean, to be honest with you, the biggest thing was moving tests upstream because now I have one change that's going in as my check-in and I have a test failure. It's obvious what's going on here. Whereas before, if that test ran that night, well, now you have a whole, days of change, whole day of changes from dozens of engineers, potentially. If that test ran once a week, now we have a, a large number of changes, the test fails, and it's like, okay, where do I start? Because we know we have a ton of changes that have gone in. So I'm really pleased with the, the results that we've, we've gained over the, the last few years, and hopefully there's some things both in the product and from the principal's perspective that we can you know, better transfer into the ecosystem. Okay, so with that, we're going to start talking about testability features, and Joris and I haven't really planned this out that well, so we will... Uh... <laughs> <You're doing great. laughs> okay, Joris has talked plenty this week, so uh, he's going to pass the buck to me, apparently. Okay, so what are the, uh, what are the, the basic tools to address the tests in the pyramid from an automation perspective? Um, so... At the unit component level, it's all about SysTest. And the, if you guys don't know what the SysTest framework is, how many, I guess, how many know about sys, what sys, the SysTest framework is? Most, but not all. Okay, so SysTest is a unit test framework that's in, that's in our X++ tool set. It's been there since, I think, AX4. Um, it's a test harness like NUnit or JUnit or uh, all, all those, you know, typical unit type test things that provide basic functionality to um, a, a test harness for you to uh, um, write your tests from a code perspective. But the great thing with AX7 is that now it integrates very nicely into Visual Studio and it looks like any other test. And that was enabled by some Visual Studio changes. Visual Studio used to have a test framework called MS Test and that was what you used. They've written that, rewritten that over the last few years to be a, uh, a pluggable test harness. So in Visual Studio, now you can run NUnit tests and, and other types of tests, including SysTest tests, right natively into the, uh, into the Visual Studio um, environment. And you also can run them in an automated fashion with the nightly builds. And yours is going to show some of that later. As you move up into the, the pyramid, you get into the opportunity to use Task Recorder for creating your tests. Um, and Task Recorder... You've used it for other things, business process uh, creation and, and the like. You also have the ability with Task Recorder to import the task recording into Visual Studio and create a, an X++ sys test if you choose. I think maybe the previous session I talked a little bit about also creating C Sharp tests from that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference of, between those types of tests in a bit. Um, but we... Our tests internally are, are almost all X++ based at this point, which was a bit of a controversial thing at the time. Um, in X2012, the test team wrote most of our tests in C Sharp, and they're kind of what I'd call an outside-in test. They worked through the actual user interface, um, not quite at the UI level, but right under the covers. So a lot of our challenges from a performance standpoint were because those tests, whenever you have a test that interacts strictly through the UI, um, it's, it's fraught with problems. That's, that's just the way it's always been. Tools are better today than they have been, but it's still, still a bit of a challenge. So SysTest and task, recorders, uh, task Recorder tests, although um, we're going to talk mostly about Task Recorder tests uh, being generated into SysTest tests. So the improved testability comes from a couple key things. And the fundamental thing that enabled it was our architectural change. So it's kind of a real simplified view of, of uh, the architecture. This is, again, another real old slide, um, or content on the slide. So in AX2012, from a UI perspective, we had, we had the idea of a logical control, but that logical control was running on the client because we had a rich client. So you had a physical control sitting on top of the logical control running on the client, interacted with the server. Well, with the move to HTML and a web-based client, we moved that logical control onto the server. And now all you're left with on the client is this physical control. And what that enabled us to do is to do, create form-based tests that can run on the server. So they're not running through the UI at all, but it's interacting with the logical control. 
So you're exercising the UI just like it was coming through the wire from client to the server. You don't see anything, which was a concern from folks uh, that we weren't going to see what's going on with the test, so how are we going to debug that? That concern went away pretty quickly. Um, and we really liked the idea, and especially when we moved test engineering together, everything's written in the same technology now in X++, and that was another enabler for us to um, improve our testing situation. So that was a, a big step forward, and, and the thing that we did um, to make that even easier is we introduced this idea of a form adapter. And some of you, I, I know, who, who are writing some tests have seen the form adapters. And all the form adapters are, is a, are a set of strongly typed APIs for you to interact with the UI. So you can kind of navigate from an API perspective to interact with the, with the forms. And I'll give you an example in a slide what that looks like. The other thing that we, we did, which was a, a pretty low-level change, and it was enabled by the fact that we have tests running in X++, is that we have automated data rollback on all of our tests, and it's nested, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple slides. But that one of the big challenges you have with when you run a large volume of tests is, is uh, debris left behind from one test to the next test. And if it's up to the test author to make sure things are in a clean state, it doesn't always work that well. That's, there's coding errors, there's exceptions that get thrown in the test where things don't get rolled back properly, and then pretty soon you have a corrupt environment that your, your fixture, uh, your test fixture is now corrupt, and you might have a whole bunch of tests that are gonna fail. So the automatic rollback, which is baked into the SysTest framework, ensures that you're back to the state that you started with before the test uh, began and then you can go forward with, with confidence. So the way form adapters work, you, it's generated code. So you have to specify a model that you want to generate your form adapters into. And it's actually the opposite. You specify in the model that you want the form adapters to reside in, you tell them which product model you want to generate into it. It's, it's a little bit backwards. It's just how we, the best way that we could, the best approach we could take to implement it ultimately. But this is something you're gonna have to do. This is documented out in the wiki. So if you create new forms um, and you wanna use form adapters, we ship the form adapters out of the, that, we, that we use internally that are mapped to our forms. Those are all shipped, those are all available. But if you have additional forms as part of your solution or implementation, you're gonna to have to take this step. But when you take this step, you can write code like this. Um, so this is a sys-test test, a sys-test method, and it's basically a, you wrap things in a using statement so that things get disposed of properly, the form gets disposed properly, and all this particular test is doing is it's setting a value on um, one checkbox, and it's verifying that a couple other checkbox, check boxes are enabled properly. So it's a, it's a very simple test, but you can see from the API, it's kind of this chaining mechanism to uh, walk through to interact with the form. This probably isn't, I mean, this isn't the high, a super high value test. If we, the other thing we looked at a lot was what's the value of the test. Um, form logic is usually pretty simple. It's not your top priority. Business logic is much more important but it's just an example to show you how form adapters can be used. And Dave, I just wanted to add, I think yep. this, is, um, this is code you can, you can write. These are the kind of tests that you can write, but this is also the sort of code that the task recording will generate, right? So when you go through a task recording and you can import the task recording in Visual Studio, it'll be more elaborate than this, obviously, but this is the kind of code that gets generated, right? So, it's perfectly fine to do these types of tests, and we create some of these manually as well. But obviously, it's a lot of code, right, if you want to do something a bit more complex. But that, this is exactly what the task recording will generate for you if you use that feature. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so the data rollback, um, it's SQL technology, not X++ technology. We've had similar functionalities that we've used internally in the past that have been based on X++. 
but this is using SQL save points and basically rolling things back as you go. So it's, it's, it's very robust from that perspective. And then it's also nested. So if you do some things from a t test suite to a class to a method from a setup perspective, and even the method itself, it's going to roll back incrementally. So I, I, we have a sequence eye chart on the next, next uh, slide to give you an idea. But the whole point here is that as you go from, if you look at the second, the one on the right, um, where you have the, the swim lanes of suite test class one and test class two, um, it just shows you from a sequence standpoint how it's nesting those different levels and rolling things back as you go from a database perspective. So another thing that we enabled from a testability standpoint is the support for role-based testing. And this is an example of that. Uh, basically, you specify the role in an attribute, like you see in the top. And there's two different examples here, two different roles that are, are named. Um, and it, you don't have to do anything in your test method if you want to use just one role in the test method, which is the typical thing that you would do. You just specify this attribute. And by default, the test will execute in that role. Um, but you also have the example um, in the code here that you can change the security context within a test method from one to the other, just again with the using statement and, and wrapping things up like that so things get disposed of properly. Okay, so from a task recorder perspective, like we said, we target the top of the test pyramid um, for functional regression automation SysTest is, is where we're recommending at this point. Um, but just because you can record a long test doesn't mean you should necessarily record a long test. Um, I mean, I've I played with the coded UI capability in Visual Studio multiple times over the years. It, it's not as easy as it looks to record a test reliably and get it running, ba running, running back in a reliable way. So again, think about what you're testing. Keep it simple. Yeah, there's a need sometimes to run longer, a longer sequence, and, and you need to have some of those tests, but don't go crazy with that. Try to keep them granular to the best of your ability. Um, with recording, you, get, you, you, you have to start in a known space, known state all the time, both from a data and a navigation standpoint. So that's, that's really important. Um, there's a desire to chain tests together, which means you know I, I want to do this step of the process, then this step, and this step, and this step. And, and it does seem like a good idea on the surface. Um, it just doesn't work very well. It's, it, we've tried this in the past as well. And th from a reliability standpoint, it just doesn't exist the qualities that we, we want to have. So, and there's no support for it in SysTest in, in general. So. The, if you're thinking about doing that, it, it doesn't work at this point. Um, I would say at this point, probably the best practice that I've seen, at least in some places, is having a functional person do the recording. Um, but I, the back end side of creating a sys test test, I mean, it's not hard to generate the code, um, but in general, uh, supporting that is, is still a developer activity. When the test fails, eventually you're going to have to go look at some code and try to figure out what's going on. And at, at this point, that's what, the best way to go about it. We are looking at and starting to invest in some tooling that would be purely a functional person's tools based on Task Recorder. We weren't ready to show anything uh, this week with that, but that is something that's being worked on. And it, it, will, it won't exhibit the test qualities that that I've talked about earlier necessarily, but it might be the best solution in a lot of scenarios. And, and I'll be frank, I mean, we, we have engineers who write tests at Microsoft, and we want an engineering tool set. So we want, our engineers want to write code, and they want to write well understood, concise code, um, if at all possible. And I know that's not the scenario typically out in the ecosystem, because typically there's it's more of a domain expert that's going to be doing a lot of the testing. So we're trying to find the right balance of tooling to support both those audiences. 
The sys-test-based automation, especially the lower part of the pyramid, again, is, is really focused on the, uh, the engineering uh, folks. And the great thing uh, that we have going forward with, with extensions is that that's a much more testable solution than overlayering is. So as you're developing extensions, both for ISV products and for implementations, there's a great opportunity moving forward to create tests for those that are, that are truly more unit tests. Um, so again, keep a focus on what you're trying to test. More tests that do a single thing is better than fewer tests that do multiple things. Um, and, and just going back to our previous experience with AX2012 with a test tool that worked from the outside in, there's a tendency to do too much in our test methods because it was expensive to set up the test to get to a point to arrange the test, arrange the, the environment to the point where you could do the test. So we would tend to do too much in our tests because this was expensive. Being an X++, that's no longer expensive. So we're, not, we're, we're no longer um, afraid of doing setup more frequently. But we also try to keep the setup really granular. And we can do it really granular because we're working at the, uh, the developer level in SysTest. Um, arrange act assert is a best practice for your tests. So the idea is you have an arrange section which, where you set up your environment for the test. You have an act where you do something. And then you have your assert section where you actually go and validate that what you did was right. And we've, we've taken that as a best practice in general internally to structure our code like that um, to make it clear what, what's going on. You can set your data up at the test class level. That's probably the ultimate place to do it for a, a set of tests. So if you have a put your tests that have common needs into a, a class, use the class level setup. Tear down, you really don't have to worry about because of the, the data rollback. But you set tests at the class level. And then as the methods run, even if they may be changing some things, it's going to be rolled back to that state of the class setup as you go. Um, the last one is, is optional in reality, um, but it's been helpful for us. So you can actually specify what the granularity is for the test using this attribute. And w there's two things you can do with that. One, you can, within Visual Studio, you can filter or arrange your tests based on traits. And traits are basically just attributes. And granularity is one of those attributes that you can filter on. So you can say, if I want to run my unit tests, I, I know which ones they are. And then the second part is just to see if you're building a pyramid or an hourglass or an upside down pyramid or exactly what you're doing, which is just helpful from an information perspective. Question? Functionally doesn't do anything. It's just more for information. So that's, well, I'll say it's optional, but I, I'm really glad we, we invested in doing it because I have a much better understanding of what we've done after the fact. All right, we have a demo. I can quit talking. That was a, a lot of talking, but yeah. All right, so I have a, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I have one minute left to do my demo. For those of you who were in sessions prior, you've seen this, this is not gonna work. I might as well just show something else and let this thing restart now. Let me just close it and let it go. Well, it's been a good conference, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's just great. So still, I assume it's still going to restart. Right? I'll demo the other thing first. Can I just push this through and just say restart? There we go. I hope the update's not going to mess up like the machine or something. Because <laughs> that never happens. All right, let's go here first. So those of you who have been to, into my, uh, were in my uh, continuous delivery session before, I showed you the gated check-in feature. Um, That's kind of what Dave was saying we definitely use internally now as well where you know, we have so many engineers working on the app, we want to avoid running 24-hour you know, worth of tests at the end of the week because now you have dozens of engineers times you know, five working days of changes and good luck finding out why tests are failing, right? So the fact is right now, anytime somebody makes a check-in, 
that checking is pending until a build has successfully completed, including the tests that need to be run. And only then, if it's successful, will the, will the checking be um, uh, allowed into the source control. And at least that way, we know exactly what changed. So if a test fails, we, we, we know that. And I'll show you how this, this is relevant here. I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, so this is the, the automated build that comes out of the box. I showed some of this already in the previous session. But essentially, um, on this one, this is a, a code base, I have essentially six tests, right? So this, Dave was talking about this as well. Our, our, because of some of the changes made in Visual Studio, as well as the fact that our X++ language is now pure.net language, we have a lot of these integrations with the Visual Studio tooling that we get for free. And this is one of those examples where the unit tests run as part of the build and all these fancy reporting uh, things just shine through and we get all of that. So this is one of those examples. Um, it says here I had six tests. They all passed. No fail tests. You see with the fail tests there, it actually has a new one existing. So if you have a continuous build or a nightly build or something like that, if there's a test that's never failed before, it'll show up here. It says there's one one uh, test that started failing now, or you got five that have been failing for a while, and you get all these little uh, cool stats. And actually, if I go to the detailed report, uh, and by default, it actually filter on uh, failed. So I'm going to show all the unit tests. All right, and you actually see here, uh, boom. you actually see here for all these tests, these six that I have, you see there's a column that says failing since and failing build. So you can kind of keep track of when did this start happening so that if you do have continuous integration without gated check-in, you can start seeing, like, okay, this started failing you know, on build number whatever, and you can start going back to see what changed in that build and those types of things. So these are all fancy features that we're, we're getting for free these days. So the other feature, I actually do have another dev box, but uh, let's see if this thing can, can connect again. Uh, I have another desk box, but the I don't have the unit tests on there, so hopefully this all this is back up. If not, I can switch to that. Yeah, oh, there you go. Probably be slow now. Yours. The one question I had is continuous delivery. Were you, are you talking about builds and stuff, or are you talking about your sessions? Because it seems like you've been continuously <laughs> delivering sessions for the last after, three after days. After three days of presentations, <laughs> it's just all kind of one big thing to yeah. me now. Yeah. All right. Just wasn't sure. <clears throat> okay. This this is not connecting. So let me switch to the OLM while we look. So this does have one unit test, and it's uh, utterly not interesting. But um, at least we can we can move on. So. In Visual Studio, you have this test explorer, right? So as soon as you start adding unit tests in your X++ code, this thing will continually refresh. So as you start you know, compiling and writing code, your tests will start showing up here as well. So again, this is standard Visual Studio for those of you who work with that. And you can actually see here, there's like just one little uh, unit test. This, I think, is the example I used in the other session. Um, but the unit tests start showing up here. And you can run them at any time. So that kind of goes back to the point that Dave was making about making them reliable, fast. You should be able to run them over and over again without things failing. Since we have that automatic rollback, that should not be an issue, right? Because you know, before, let's say you do something with, with a customer, uh, and the customer has a credit limit, maybe after a while of doing many, many, many tests, that customer starts hitting their credit limit, and now all your tests are failing. So I would say the rollback is a big piece of that, and you want them to be fast, right? You want this developer to continue. Maybe you wrote this stuff. He needs to make a change to it. He probably wants to run these tests. He should not have to worry. I mean, the, sh the code should make sense. Naming conventions are important. I think there's a lot of literature out there in general about naming conventions for tests. So take a look at those things as well. And then obviously, anytime you know you find a bug, we do that internally as well. If there's a major bug, we find something we overlooked. You want to add a test to the existing test suite that now starts specifically looking for that issue, so that you no, no longer have any regressions. Right? If you do the next upgrade, something changes you're still explicitly checking for that bug from five years ago. Those are important things to kind of avoid regressions with, with issues. So in this case, I think if I, uh, let me just try one more time to see if the other guy connects or not. If not, I'll just run this one. It's just not as interesting. No, I guess not. Um, so let me just compile this one. So in general, these tests, uh, just from a, yeah, that's the one. 
Um, from a setup perspective, you know, they typically are separated in their own model, in their own package, because that's the type of thing that's internal. You don't deploy that to production. You don't ship it to your customer, those types of things. So you want to separate those out. Um, so I run the build here, and then now I can just... Um, there's a couple of ways you can just run all. I can run select the tests. There's also a feature to say debug select the tests, right? So if you do end up with a failure, you have no idea. You just set a couple of breakpoints, and you can debug the test as it runs. Those, those things all exist. And it'll start actually um, sorting this in failed and completed as well. So this is you know, a simple example of one unit test, but maybe you have a couple dozen for something large that you've been building. You know, you're trying to fix code. You run all the tests, five fail figure it out, fix it, you just run the failed ones again to kind of continue your progress. That's also where the traits come into play that uh, Dave was talking about. You can put the attributes on, and then you actually see it here. It says no traits one. So I have one test that has no attributes. You can sort of start grouping and filtering these things if, you, if you're working with a lot of tests. So if I run this now, um, so it'll actually, it'll probably try to compile it again. I've seen it do that. So it kind of depends on how large your packages are, but this let me just see if I can. I guess that's a screenshot when you zoom in. So it's running. There we go. So you can see here everything screen. Uh, it took 281 milliseconds. Is that does that pass the speed test? I don't know. Uh, and then here in the bottom, you can you can see there was an info log message, which is actually what this test is checking for. So you can even check for exceptions, right? If you're writing writing these tests, you want to check for the happy path, but you also want to check for the not so happy path, right? So you can actually create a unit test that explicitly says, I'm expecting this then to throw an exception. And then if it doesn't, the test fails. So there's all these, these, these little, little things. Yes? No, no, go ahead. I'm still waiting for this other machine to come up, so, you know. I wanted to ask you before I forgot. Yeah. So the question is, is there a way to, I don't think so, is there a way to set up a test to fail if it takes too long? Not that I'm aware of. Um, no, that, we, yeah, we don't have a, there's nothing built in with that. I mean, that's, so one of the things we've done periodically internally is we go through a test hygiene phase where we'll look for long running tests and things like that because we track all that information and we'll go and clean those tests up. But uh, no, I, yeah, I don't mean that the test has failed, but the, Let's say we're testing for performance. Uh -huh. If the method takes more yeah. than 300 milliseconds to run, then we would consider it a failure, although the return value may be correct. I think that goes back to violating Dave's principle of testing different things at once. Right. I mean, if it is a performance test, you actually are looking to see how long it takes, and you would fail because it takes too long. Right. That's what you're testing there in that case. So, I mean, you can do that from – I'm not real familiar with the performance testing – Framework, but I, I would think that you could you could you're going to get the time back and you could you can uh, fail on that. I agree. It wouldn't make sense to have an AR written put a threshold at a baseline and do you measure the yeah. performance you getting? That right, but that then yeah. So the the thing is you know putting in thresholds and whatnot, but that really get, then gets down back to performance testing, right? And that's, that's yeah. And I'm, I mean, I, I get the point. There isn't anything built into the framework at all. I mean, we actually do have telemetry that gets logged with. Uh, these tests, not that that's necessarily easy to access as well, but yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get to a box to yours, but apparently that rebooted. No, no, no. It's, well, it's so. actually it's it's back up. It just as expected, okay. a little bit slow because it just rebooted. Um, so um, so I showed you the the build. So we have integrated that with the build. Um, I showed you the test explorer inside of Visual Studio. Um, so you want to be able to run those tests as you're coding. I think Dave touched on that. Like you know test-driven development principles if you want to go down that route of, of writing your class interfaces without actually implementation. Write the unit test first, see what you're expecting, then actually write the code and see how your unit tests are doing. It's kind of a way to abstract some of that thinking. So the test-driven development pieces are definitely uh, an option now a lot more than they ever were. They have a, it's still loading, so keep asking questions, yeah, I guess. All the standard test cases that you guys have used, are those available? I didn't see that question coming, Dave. Did you? <laughs> oh, wait, really? Um, so, <laughs> do you want to do you want to elaborate or? Yeah. So this has been an ongoing request. As you can see, we have a lot so, of. Tests. Well, I guess we probably want to repeat. So the question yeah, that we're just, joking about is, yeah. 
You know, so the we, question was, are the tests that we have from Microsoft available for the ecosystem? And no, is the, is the short answer. Well, so the tests do, there, there's, the tests bring along more than just the tests themselves. We, we have some internal helper classes, which we would need to productize in order to make sure that they're valuable for you and you can understand what they do. Um, I don't know that foisting 100,000 tests on the ecosystem is really going to help in the end because at some point they fail and you're going to have to understand what's going on. Um, and then the third thing is I think going forward with extensions that it's our goal is to be less and less concerned about what's, you know, the Microsoft piece should just work because what you're doing is additive, not, not replacing functionality. We do need to do a better job of getting some examples out there for you. Um, I, I, I definitely, we agree on, on that. Um, and also, you know, I, other needs will we'll open up for more questions. We've got, we got plenty of time left here and we don't have too much more to go through. But start thinking about now, what would you like to see to get more help to enable you to move forward with testing uh, in an easier fashion? So keep that queued up from a question perspective. I've got one over there, too. Uh, so a small question. Um, the Dust Manager Visual Studio, you not post uh, their test cases created with SysTest and converted them to the API? So the question is, so the test explorer I'm showing, will it show both the unit tests you wrote manually as well as the task recorder test? The answer is yes, because ultimately, uh, the unit test code that you have, the task recorder import will essentially generate that code. So you'll have the code. So this, I mean, from a code perspective, they're the same. They're just created differently. And basically, if Microsoft doesn't ship both internal helper tests, right? Let's say we as a partner, we create our own library, let's say 5,000 test cases. Is it possible to manage it in test explorer? So I would say the answer is yes, but I'm not sure that I understand the question. So, so I think it's it's a best practice to to not repeat yourself, right? Don't repeat yourself is one of those software engineering fundamentals. Um, so that's where you create these helper classes that that can help. Um, set up your tests. It is a, some tests don't need those. We, we've done it, we've overdone it in the past, to be honest with you. We've, we've had our helper classes do too much, and all of a sudden we are suffering because it takes too long to set up. We have this idea of a mystery guest, and a mystery guest is when something that's not part of your test is causing problems with your tests. So we've been making efforts to simplify our, uh, our helper classes. Um, but it's not a one-size-fits-all is the other thing. I think a lot of cases you're going to want to build a helper, a set of helper libraries that are very targeted for your solution. So I wanted to show some code. These are very simple examples. Um, but so essentially the way the unit test is structured, you have one suite class, which is essentially kind of grouping, and then you have test classes with test methods that do the actual uh, the actual testing. So as Dave said, the rollbacks, so in each step that gets executed, so first the suite starts, there's a setup method, which you see here. Uh, it'll instantiate the test classes that, are, that you want to run. There's a, you know, a safe point at that point, and then each test method. So the rollback is at every level. One of the best practices that we've come up with, and this, this obviously uses some new X++ features here, uh, is this, this test suite class actually uh, exposes a couple of, a couple of um, public static constants, uh, meaning that in this test suite class, I can actually set up a couple of specific data examples that I can now reuse in all of the test classes that I'm going to make. So in this case, uh, there's a small customization in here that has to do with um, uh, the credit max on the, on the customer. It's, it's somewhat irrelevant, but it ties it back to payment terms. So what this is doing here in this, in this setup code, essentially, um, we're really after just the basic code that we need to be able to run our tests. 
So I want to avoid my test failing because I'm inserting a record in the item table because I need one. But the item table has a bunch of mandatory fields. When you call insert, there's a bunch of business logic. None of that is relevant for my test. I just need to have that item record to use in some of my testing purposes. So that's why in this case, you'll see a lot of these do updates, do inserts. I'm not saying you have to do that all the time. But in many cases, all you're after is just a couple of fields in some table or a record. Just do it quick and dirty. We see internally, and that goes back a little bit to the uh, helper classes, internally some of our teams have built for their purposes a couple of classes that can create some of these records quickly for what they need um, so that they sort of have a little bit of a, a data framework that just generates some records for, for what they need. But in this case, I can create these records. And in, uh, for example, this customer parameters, there's some two new fields with a threshold and a number of days. And for both of those, I'm actually using my new static constants. The reason why I do that is now, now I can have multiple tests that depend on these specific values to test specific things, right? So I do this whole test setup here, and then my test should be pretty predictable, and you don't have all these magic values all over your, your test code. So this is kind of one, one example here. Um, that's the setup. So obviously going down to the tests themselves, and I know if Dave's gonna cringe if I'm va violating some uh, naming conventions here, but uh, weather through, I guess. Uh, so this is my test class itself, so extends this test case. All of these you know, extensions and stuff is um, extending classes is, is documented pretty well. Um, most of this is actually similar to 2012. There's only some, a few things that were added, and of course, features around rollback and all. So this, this, uh, this class has, what was it, I think, uh, six methods in total, yes? Six methods. So each one of those, as Dave said, is very precise. It tests one particular issue, and I have tests that test the happy path, and I have some that, that test the not so happy path where I'm expecting things to fail, especially in this case, because this code actually does a validation, so it's supposed to fail if, if the validation fails. So, you know, going back to the, uh, um, the AAA principle of uh, arrange, act, and assert, same thing here. So my arrangement is, you know, I do, um, I set up these fields on a, on a customer table. See, I don't even insert the record because that's totally irrelevant for what I'm doing. But I am using specific values that I have inserted prior and that I know are supposed to fail or supposed to pass. Um, so in this case, I set the fields, then I actually do my act, which is I actually validate field. Interestingly, in this case, obviously this is the, the standard validate field um, that exists on every table, but the way the code was written behind here, it, it uses a handler. So I've not actually overlaid the validate field method, although there's code in there in standard AX, but I have a handler, and obviously this thing should, you know, I expect this to be executed, uh, you know, like any other code. Um, and then obviously I'm expecting in this case that this validation will, will pass just fine. And then obviously I have cases for the exact opposite. Um, I'm checking, uh, well, this one should pass as well. Um, I'm explicitly checking, you know, the less than or equal versus just the equal. All, a few of these edge cases are interesting to test and I'm, I'm expecting specific things to happen. So that's sort of the, 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 the global thing that I wanted to show is, is the test setup, the fact that you want to create some of these records. Use the, the static constants. I found them very useful to just have a whole set. If I need to add another test for a bug I find, I can reuse the data that my test suite has already created just because I have a specific ID for payment terms or a specific value of, a, of credit limit that I know is supposed to be hit or not be hit. So that's uh, the setup. Do you have another question that I... <laughs> no. Dave's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> or ordering is, is, a, is a, so you want to be able to go into your test explorer and run a given test that's the test that, that's important for you then. And you want to, if you always run things in the same order, you start to build in dependencies that are going to bite you later. There, there's also capability to discover related tests. So if you go to a, a class or a table, um, you can right-click it in it in uh, the Explorer window, and it'll find the, the tests that might be impacted by that uh, a change to that particular class, and that will be independent of, of. I think we do pull in probably the entire class in those cases, but yeah, in general, you don't want ordering. Ordering is evil.
Right. And it goes back to, you know, as Dave said, first of all, it violates sort of that one of those principles, but also the fact that, you know, if I have these, you know, I only have six tests here, but I may have a hundred, I want to be able to, if there's only one or two failing and I find the issue, I want to first rerun those to make sure it got fixed and then rerun. So they need to be able to run independently, one at a time, all at a time. And the, the group by here, actually, this is a little bit of, of a feature that's helpful. So I, I right-clicked on that not run tests, so that, that grouping thing. And I can say I want to group this by, by the class, so the test class. There's apparently a duration feature here. So if there's some that run long, I guess I can sort by that. Uh, the traits, the projects, so you kind of group them like that. And then you can see with the, the same right-click menu, I can actually say run selected tests. So if you use some of those attributes that Dave was talking about to sort of do the, the categorization, you can filter it here or group it here by traits and say, okay, I just right-click and only run the ones with those traits. So again, there you want to maintain that independence, yes. Um, at every step of the way, basically, with each. So the question was, every, you know, yeah. when, when or how, or when is the the data roll back? Yeah. So it's rolling back. It's it's you get a snapshot when you start your test suite. You get a snapshot when you go do your class setup. You get a. You so so you get a a save point after your class setup. And then your method will run, and after that method, it snaps back to your class setup. Another method runs back to your class setup and on down the line. Which is another good reason that, you know, maybe from a performance perspective, since I do a lot of the setup on my suite level, all the test classes within that suite, it's not going to, like, uh, have to reinsert all the records all the time. It's just only the changes that potentially those tests make will be rolled back, right? Yes, sir. No, 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 it's, it's, it's at, a, at a SQL level, right? So it's really just at, before it executes the method, it does a SQL save point. So whatever you do to the database, you know, you can drop all the tables if you want, I guess, but at the end, it's going to put them all back. Yeah, yeah so and, and it, the, uh, one of the, a challenge can be is if you're debugging something and you're trying to look to see what's actually happening in the database, and every time the test gets done, the database is back at its known state, that can be sometimes challenging. So... There is a way to disable that. There's a, it's an attribute that you can put on the on the class that will tell you say don't don't roll back, and that you can at least temporarily do that to debug it. Marianne. Uh, I'm wondering when you talked about this wonderful tool of being able to use the task recorder to bring in the test, do you then also have to put in your own assert statements? Is is everything completely done? Just that's that's a good question. So the question was, uh, if you use the task recording, you know, it generates a lot of this code, but where do these asserts come from, right? How do you, do you have to add the manual or not? So the answer to that is you, you can, and in many cases you may have to. Uh, but the task recording actually, and um, it's just, I would say, I would demo it, but the system's I, I, so slow right now. I have a demo but, if we want. Uh, I we can, show. yeah, and I, I we'll probably end up here, with, so. with having some time. I just made the, one of these tests fail on purpose, so I just kind of wanted to... Show and it doesn't. Oh, there we go. Here's the build. Um, so, but with the task recording, and, and they will show that. But you have while you're recording, you have a couple of, of uh, features that you can you can do. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually not going to show the recording, but you can do that during the recording. But you also can go and add a method after the fact that maybe goes against the database instead of the UI to verify that your 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 uh, change is there. So, okay, I'm running these tests. Um, Okay. You, you, you do the task recording um, in the app itself. So um, you don't run the app from Visual Studio? You don't have. No, no you can run it on any. Task recorder is a, a feature of the product. Um, so what you do is you kick off, start the task recorder in the product, and then you uh, do some stuff, and then you stop recording, and then you have the option then to you basically export an XML file. And then you read that XML file into Visual Studio. Now, originally, you can also save it in Word, so you can still do both. 
um, to task so, so yeah, so the question is, originally task recording went to Word, so today after you're done recording, you get a couple of different options, what do you want to do? You can save it to the BPM library, which is another feature. You can export it to Word, you can download it, what's called, I think it's called a developer, a developer task or something, yeah, and yeah, that downloads the task. XML, which you can then import here. Yeah. So just to quickly finish this off, so I made one of the tests fail, you see the fail test show up, if I actually click on that, um, you'll see at the bottom, I didn't put a message in here, so you can actually add a message. It says if it fails, I want this particular thing to show up. Uh, but in this case, it, it essentially just says my assertion fails. It was expecting false, and it actually got a true, right? So these are the kinds of things. This is probably something where you want to add a message to be a bit more clear. But if your naming convention on your, your classes and methods are clear, it should be already pretty obvious what, what's going on there. Exactly. So. Do you want to okay, yeah, let's, let's look over and I'll, I'll do a little bit of a demo here in Task Recorder. Do you have any more slides at the end? That you have the data management ones? Okay, that's it. Okay, so if you're not familiar with Task Recorder, Oh, this is where the AV guy said you have to change your resolution. Well, I, I, think, I think it was just to get rid of the windows, but... Um, oh. Maybe not. Uh, well, why don't you talk about data management for a second? <laughs> well, yeah, but I need the screen back. So. Um, All right, we'll see. We'll we'll see if let's continue and we'll yeah, see if we can I'll, get I'll maybe see if at I the can end of the demo. resolution here, yeah. and make our life better. Sorry about that. All right. All right. So the other topic that we wanted to talk about was data. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, the question is, do the tests run in parallel? Um, in the test explorer, no. I'm guessing during the builds, I don't know if there's any sort of feature. I'm not aware of. Uh, no, I don't. I'm, you can force that, but, well, no, they don't. We, we have some infrastructure internally that we do to parallelize things, but uh, it's not built into the, the okay. dev environment. Right, no, so the question is, can we sequence them? So no, I mean, that would violate the principles. Yeah, exactly. So also with the task recording pieces, and it goes back to having these lengthy tests, right? We've had some customers who said, this is great. I can do a vendor to cash scenario that I usually test. Yeah, yeah good luck with that, right? Uh, <laughs> First of all, it's, it's almost impossible. It's actually a limitation, I think, even on task recording of how long they actually can be. But ultimately, it, it, it doesn't really gain you much, right? But in such a case, you could split that up, obviously. You could have a, a test that creates a vendor. Maybe there's some things you've customized or something you want to test there. You could have one that creates a sales order. But then it comes back, and it's a perfect segue, that comes then back to your data management, right? Is um, and that's typically where people want to do these end-to-end -end scenarios because you know you, you need a vendor created maybe you explicitly need one that has had no transactions before to be able to do your test cleanly and so that's where people see this need to do this end-to-end -end thing or chain particular tests one after another because I know I've created a vendor there and I want to use it in this test because it has no transactions yet. But then it's like, how do I get the vendor number over? And I mean, it becomes this convoluted. And there's, I can see why people ask for the feature, but it, it's almost impossible to, to properly manage this type of thing. And it comes back to data management, right? So if you do want to split a process like that up into, into multiple chunks, uh, that's fine. But you may still have a need to say, I need a vendor without transactions. I need a sales order that's partially invoiced because I need to test the specific invoicing feature, those types of things. And that's where the data management piece come, comes into play. Um, so the unit tests are easy enough in the data management. I showed you the fact that the test suite created some really you know, very basic records doing do inserts, only putting a couple of fields in there. And they're small enough, you know, typically that they can do that. That's perfectly fine. Um, and then you know, the isolated mode and the rollback. 
with the the integrated testing and the task reporting test, that's where you get into that. And that's where you need a proper data set, right? Internally, we do a lot of testing on, on the demo database. A lot of our tests are based purely on that because we know the state of that database. Our automated build process that we provide out of the box has a feature to restore a database at the beginning of the build, right? That's exactly the purpose. You wanna, even if you do some sort of a rollback, you wanna have a known state before you get started. Um, some, uh, some people that I've been talking to were trying to take that to the extreme and said, well, we're, since we're using data management features out of AX, you know, we have all these template files we filled in, we have our configuration stored in LCS, we wanna now make all of the, put all of that together and have our build process, we restore a blank database, we run all our data imports, and you can guess kind of what happens at that point. The build is running for hours, it fails regularly, we have some person who just changed the template and putting a wrong customer group and the whole import, those types. So please don't do that, right? There's, there's, there is something to be said for managing your data set that way, right? If you have a standard golden configuration that you're using for an implementation, that's probably a good idea to use exactly that one for your, um, for your tests. The problem is during an implementation that data just gets changed constantly. There's a change management process around that. And it's kind of opposite to what you need for the tests. The tests need to be very reliable. You need to know exactly what the data state is at the beginning so you can continue. So my advice to those people has been, I like the idea of having some sort of an automation that you know, if you manage your config files, if you manage Excel templates, all those things, and you manage them in LCS or maybe in VSDS. Maybe you can create your own process, and these people have. They just put it inside the build. But if you created a process that starts with a blank database and imports all the data, great. Now take that database after you've validated and know it's correct and put that on the build VM. And from now on, you start using that for unit tests, and the build VM can restore that. After a couple of weeks, you're doing more golden config. You're changing things. Maybe you need to adjust some of your tests to actually... Uh, work properly with those config changes you've made. Okay, now you're ready to do that, then you can run another blank database, import all your configs, and now start using that for tests. So that's kind of my advice around the data management. And this is, this is a big topic, right? The data management is typically where people run into trouble, especially with task recording, because there's such a heavy dependency in AX in general, right? When you're going through the UI, going through the processes, everything is data driven. So. It's, it's, it's a big topic. Um, I like the idea of levering LCS somehow, but I would encourage you to not mingle that in with, with your build or test processes, but you know, leverage one on top of the other, not at the same time. Um, that's exactly what the slide says. So we'll right. try one more attempt at this, just okay. a very quick uh, overview to, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Um, yes, go ahead. So, right. So the question is um, that what I just said is implying that for different kind of tests that, that you're going to do, that implies I probably want one vendor in my test database that has no transactions because maybe that's what I want to test. I have a separate vendor that maybe has some partial invoice or whatnot. I may have another one that has received goods or those types of, essentially, and the answer is, is yes. I mean, if you look at what the unit tests do, that's what we've done, but it is very really small and very isolated. And obviously, yes, when you're talking about a lot of task recordings, the data set becomes, becomes pretty large, and it becomes, and that's where the data management portion, I think people underestimate, uh, just because of the fact that AX is so data driven, and the fact that you want to make these tests repeatable. Um, that yes, you probably want specific vendors or specific customers to handle specific scenarios you're testing for. Now with the rollback features, that does mean that you could probably use that same vendor for multiple tests, right? But you do want maybe different vendors and customers in different states just because you want to test for specific uh, features. 
Okay, that works. All right, so task recorder is available from this, uh, the gear here up in the upper right. So you, you click on task recorder. Um, recording is ready. Return to main menu. No. I'm sorry, I, I was in process before. I just need to restart a new one. So create recording. I go do something. Start. Walk through my steps. Apparently, I don't have. Open the system admin and, and users or something that there's always data in that one. <laughs> Sorry, I obviously wasn't prepared for this. Here we go. All right, it, it did record it anyway and got the error. So when I'm done, you hit Hold stop. Hold on for a second before you stop here. Can we, I want to show a couple of features here. Can you um, right click on one of these fields, for example? Just right click. Yeah. Um, so once you're recording, you actually get an extra option in your right click. So in AX, if you right click, there's you know, a couple of different options to look at the control name, those types of things. While you're recording, you get the, these extra, that extra menu called task recording. I don't know if you can see it, but it actually has what, uh, four, um, four options here. Uh, there's a copy and a paste feature, there's a validate feature, and then there's an add info step. Um, that means that while you're recording, you can actually put these extra things in there. The copy and paste feature really has to do uh, with the fact that you may have, like when you save a record and you need to do something extra, you may need, I don't know, the ID number that was generated from a number sequence, whatever. Now, don't use this to start chaining all your stuff together, because that's what people have tried, but you may need this feature. So you can copy paste, and if you do that, that means the, the, the unit test that gets generated will actually take care of that thing. The other piece is the validate feature, and that kind of goes back to your earlier question around the asserts, whether you need to put those in manually. In most cases, you will, will want to do some of that, but this is a validation step that you can put in and will actually generate that as part of the generated code. And then the last thing was, uh, what was it, info, info step. add an info just step, and that's really just if you're going through this or the, the functional consultant is recording it for you, they can put it in info step so that when you generate the code, it'll actually be flagged and maybe it says, you know, check something or put an assert here or whatnot. So, you, you know, it's just a feature to put a little of a, a bookmark or a flag there. So I'm just going to hit stop here. The, one of the options here is save as developer recording. That's what you want to do. If you go to Visual Studio, and I apologize for the resolution here, um, probably doesn't get any better now. It does not. <laughs> nice. Um, Actually, we, yeah, that we can zoom, right? Yeah, we can at least zoom the code. But if you go up here, Dynamics 365, trust me, add-ins, there's, I can't even read it, import task recording. <laughs> And then you basically go out to that XML file, you import it, it'll create a new project and the like, and it'll create some code that looks like this. And one of the things you'll notice on a lot of these uh, methods, there's a syscodegen attribute. So you can actually add a method that does not have this attribute, and if you update your task recording, use the same name for the class, it'll re-import, but it'll preserve any method that you added. So if you added something for a validation step or something like that. That's how you go about doing that. And the test is showing up on the uh, test explorer on the left-hand side. Trust me on that. But that's that's basically. As so you this can works. see, this is the code that Dave was showing earlier in the slides with the form adapters, right? Where it essentially creates a client context. Uh, it, it, you know. I mean, it's it's harder to it's yeah. harder to read than what uh, a engineer would write. This is the nature of generated code, right? The, the machine doesn't know the intent in a lot of cases. So you see some variables here like C3 and C2 and, and stuff that make it harder to maintain than what an engineer who authored it himself would do. But it's, it's kind of that compromise middle ground. Between. And the other thing here, which I guess this, this example of, did I just see my or something? This example doesn't have, uh, but if you have any, there's actually a method, method here called setup data. If during the task recording you typed in some values, 
like a, a description field or a quantity or something, those will actually, similar to the code that I wrote myself, they all get added as values in one setup method so that you can potentially change them from code or you can manage them at least in a, in a, in a better place. Yeah, we, we need to go to Q&A here. And actually, if, if any of you have to bail, I think this is 4.30, but we'll, we'll, we can take some questions as a group since we ran a little long here, or we'll be here afterwards. But if you need to leave, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> No, it's, it's only, we, I mean, this is something so we... The, so the question was the SQL rollback features that we yeah. have, uh, whether there's a way to use that when doing manual testing? No, it's, it's baked into the, uh, the SysTest framework, so there's no capability other than to roll it yourself um, outside of that. And we did that by design. We just, we, we don't want to risk any data corruption scenarios outside of our testing environments, so we wanted to keep that tied into there, so. Yeah, I guess we'll take a question yeah, here. Come on up. If you, if you want questions, you come forward. Thank you.